someone who works on connection in a very different way. Um, Dr. Lozing Rabki is uh, the founder of Mehechek, uh, the executive director, and she works to really bring connection between communities and foster dialogue. And I've seen it firsthand more times than I can count. She brings people together, connections, and just is a wonderful resource and a pleasure to be around. And I'm lucky to call her my neighbor. We live a few blocks away. So this might actually be the first time we've seen each other, you know, almost face to face in a few months, even though we live within walking distance. <laughs> Hey, Dr. Lozang. Hello. Hi, Wes. How are you? I am doing well. Hello from down the street. Uh, happy <laughs> Valentine's Day. And, you know, glad that we have you as, you know, part of Women Blaze Trails. I can't think of a woman who has been more of a trailblazer and more of a, I guess, not just blazing a trail, but making sure people come with them and uplifting others to do the same. So I'm really fortunate that I got to pivot from two of my favorites and talk about the work that they're doing to connect people to what they care about. So now that I've teed you up a little bit, <laughs> what are we going to get to hear about a little bit today? Um, well, it's first of all, what a pleasure to be with you, Wes. And uh, I also, uh, my gratitude to Joe for having me here with the, all of you today. I'm just thrilled to share more with you about a topic that's very dear and near to my heart, which is uh, empathy. And um, I love exploration. I love everything you're doing and that Joe is doing. And um, I, I, I see what our nonprofit, Machik, uh, the, the pro nonprofit I co-founded with my sister, Tashi Rabji, um, I see what we're doing as a very long-term exercise in exploration, but uh, with and through empathy. And it's taken a while for me to, um, be able to frame the work this way uh, because it's not a, a typical exploration topic. I don't climb or dive or anything in between, <laughs> but um, we certainly have for the last 21 years uh, been very dedicated to the idea of trying to find ways uh, to understand um, people across um, uh, gaps, to, to bridge cultural gaps um, for the purpose of creating a mutually beneficial impact. So I'll, I'll start with uh, uh, my slideshow, and I hope this- Go ahead, bring that right up. We'll get it started for you. Okay. I'm gonna do a share screen. Yep, we'll get it, which should pop up in our little control room and I should be able to get, I see it right now. If you wanna to switch to full screen, I'll go ahead and yep. wait to start it till you go there. You're all ready to go. I will leave you to share everything and inspire Wonderful. us with what you're doing with empathy. Thank you so much. So the screen looks okay? Yep, looks great. Great, wonderful. So um, our mission as a nonprofit has been for years to, to grow a global community committed to a stronger future for Tibet. And this is one of the students who we first met years ago. And uh, for those of you who um, uh, may, may not know as much about Tibet uh, because it is such a remote rural place, um, Tibet holds a very interesting place in the global imaginary where uh, people think of it as an exotic place or a place of, of uh, Buddhism or, or a, a, a tourism destination. But for us, it is a, it's home and it's a place where real people live and have um, their very full lives and under a very difficult um, context. And so here, for example, is the village school in the place where my father was born and raised. It's called Chumba. And the local authorities had built a school for 20 students, which was highly inadequate for a community of 5,000 people. And what we did way back uh, many years ago was to build this instead, which now uh, is a primary and middle school, KG, kindergarten to grade nine, with about 850 students boarding full time. Uh, next year will be the 20th anniversary of the school, if you can believe it. We're just thrilled that it's there. And the most important thing here happening is that it's a mother tongue based bilingual school. So the children are really strongly learning their own mother tongue. And um, as I mentioned, uh, we follow the kids for many years all the way to, call, to university and uh, mentored thousands of Tibetan students, uh, both actually inside and outside Tibet over the last few decades. And um, 
I'll stop here because uh, I wanted to that just give you a bit of an idea of what we do, uh, have done, I should say, for many years, um, and the way in which this work urgently requires a deep sense of empathy for um, communities on the other side of the planet is that um, when we initially built the, the first school, uh, we were uh, we had permission to take down the old school and build a new school. We truly had no funding, and um, our first angel investors were my parents, and they are retired factory workers. Um, we were immigrants to Canada, and uh, my parents and my sister and I we really didn't have any training in fundraising and very few resources ourselves. And what my parents did out of empathy for other people's children on the other side of the world, um, you know, as far away as you can get from Canada, <laughs> uh, my parents decided to put my father's retirement savings completely into the school in order to get the process going. And um, because they made that decision, other very kind, very generous people uh, participated and the school was actually opened in 2002. Um, fast forward many years later, many of these kids have graduated college and about 15 of them are teachers back in the school. So this coming full circle, which is one of the United Nations um, uh, development goals we've actually accomplished, which is to have a circular system um, of local people controlling their own education. And on top of that, in their mother tongue. Um, this entire process has been the crucible for all the work we've done for the last 21 years. And it is, Truly, if I if I reflect on this, it is truly based on the empathy that my parents had, a deep well of of, of compassion and uh, sharing of the local parents' um, needs and their their viewpoints on the world. It's very complicated. Life is as complicated for Tibetans in the mountains uh, uh, villages as it is for us here. There are so many pushes and pulls, and my parents understood this and um, decided to. Um, you know, reach out and uh, take take actual action. So that in turn inspired my sister and I and so on and so forth. And many years later, we have uh, an organization that has been um, working globally. So um, another example of how um, exploration for us has been truly kind of fueled and um, uh, by empathy is uh, an example in this photo. Uh, for many years, uh, 11 summers, um, we were able to do this truly unique program called the Summer Enrichment Program. Um, it is the first ever summer learning program for rural Tibetan children in Tibet. And uh, although currently we are not able to do this program, um, during the time that we were able to do this program, it was an incredible learning curve. Um, and what happened is that uh, uh, not these students that you see in front of you, but from, from students in this year, um, we were able to bring, of course, uh, Tibetan and Chinese and global students from around the world uh, together for a, a month in different locations each year to um, not only teach English, but the children, Tibetan rural children, were teaching Tibetan to the Chinese and global volunteers. And in the afternoons, they would learn every manner of subject from music, art, film, photography, science, mathematics, to hip hop, dance, and uh, filmmaking. <laughs> and it was an incredible way, not only for the children, who are um, not usually rural Tibetan students do not have the opportunity to have such a breadth of education. Uh, but it was also an incredible um, and rare opportunity for um, the Tibetan and the Chinese and the global volunteer teachers to, um, sh to grow a new kind of empathy with rural Tibetan students, to see the world more from their point of view. And it's a vastly underrepresented viewpoint. So it was very important to create that encounter. And what happened this particular summer, one of the students, actually our brightest student that year, um, was told that he may be uh, kicked out of high school for participating in a program outside its county. That's the level of control that Tibetans experienced uh, and that summer. And um, the one of the Chinese students, in fact, um, 
was uh, heard about this, and um, because he he confessed, he sorry he um, confided in her, and uh, she then turned around and asked her parents to take him into their home in uh, China to finish high school uh, free of charge, um, and this is a. a, a, a not a common kind of story, but it is an excellent example of how we can come into a, a context that is very volatile, very complicated. And through education, um, we have explored ways to bring people together, to bridge the cultural divide through building empathy. Because when these um, student teachers and the students themselves come together and we work together, live in the same building, eat together, work, uh, study together, learn together uh, for, for days on end, um, we begin to create an atmosphere that is safe, that is all about mutual understanding and respect. And then the stories come out because once we create the, the context where people can understand each other's viewpoints, we create more empathy. And that leads to more patience to be able to practice deep listening. And what we have seen over 21 years is that with that willingness to be patient and listen deeply, we can actually begin to build the kind of work together that will um, end, end up in, in uh, long-term trust. And that is uh, a, a long journey, but that long-term trust in each other, uh, whether it's Tibet, Tibetans in China or diaspora or elsewhere, um, uh, cultures and communities around the world, it is something that um, has impact on our education systems, on our environment, on almost every sector. And the more we can bridge these gaps, bridge these divides, uh, we will all be uh, more empowered to um, build stronger futures together. So, um, currently, what we are able to do is, um, and, and you're all invited, everyone who's listening here, <laughs> um, we, um, our work has grown and changed over the years, depending on the, you know, the different changing circumstances in Tibet. It's been very challenging uh, to have to pivot. Um, and actually, last year, when we had to pivot once again to the virtual world, like everybody else, it almost felt familiar in the sense that, you know, having to constantly pivot uh, is something we've done for, for a while over the years. But um, my sister, Dr. Dashi Rabge, created this program called Machik Fest. Um, now, 15 years ago, <laughs> I can't believe it's been that long, but um, it's a marvelous um representation of our uh, intent and our willingness to work over the long haul to bring um, a diverse group of people, a truly diverse group of people, Tibetans, Chinese, global citizens, together face to face um, to learn about the complexities and problems in Tibet and to encourage um, the the uh, empathy needed to work towards solutions. And we, we strongly believe that without the face-to-face, -face, without the coming together, without the deep listening, um, there are so many missed opportunities uh, for uh, real problems um, to be ameliorated and for people to build the um, will, the heart level will, the intellectual will <laughs> to work together. And we have seen so many um, examples of human transformation take place over the last many years um, in ways that many people told us were not was not possible, and um, we have uh, we have we have um, of course our eyes wide open and know how difficult all of this is, but also we have seen so many uh, constructive changes happen, and it's uh, deeply inspiring to us to work with all this uh, global and growing community of people. So. Thank you so much. And um, I want to, again, extend an invitation to all of you uh, to attend our event. It's, you can check us out on the website. Um, in, and uh, if you have any questions about the complex context in which we work and, and the kinds of programs that we have been able to um, oversee and manage uh, in the last 20 years. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Lozang, for sharing that and giving us insight into what you you do and how important empathy is to everything that we do. Um, I know that, you know, when I think of empathy, I think of human, you know, person to person, 
you know, that, that connection and understanding for each other. How is that really important for, you know, any work that, you know, let's say anyone here who might be watching Women Blaze Trails, whatever work they're in, how is empathy an important part of their work, no matter what it is? Right. So I think um, an, a good example uh, away from Tibet is what Erica, uh, a wonderful presentation that Erica just gave, so enjoyed it. Um, she concluded by talking about the importance of creating empathy um, because you can have all the best technology, the research, the, the everything, the, the funding, but um, until people begin to care, until people um, can see that this world, um, this environmental problem or this education problem or this language conflict or other kinds of conflict all around the world is, that, that are happening, until you can see that it affects both of us, that, um, uh, that, that there's that level, until you can see that it affects uh, everyone equally, we're not going to, um, uh, be able to make the kind of sacrifices and work hard enough for the long haul to make the changes necessary. And I think the the global pandemic has <laughs> truly taught us, um, of course, the a very profound lesson on interdependence, um, how incredibly interwoven we are, and the need to have profound uh, empathy for each other. Uh, for example, unless this um, uh, unless the vaccination is truly a global project, um, the, the, the virus will be around and with us for years to come. Um, and um, and, and uh, for example, in um, back to Tibet, we work with these incredible social innovators who are uh, just uh, amazingly creative, amazingly strategic and inspiring people working on HIV AIDS education, cons conservation, feminist um, uh, issues and publishing inside Tibet. Um, they are in a very challenging circumstance um, they're able to innovate, they're able to lead, and they're able to inspire people around the world because um, they are able to build uh, multi-level multi stakeholder groups. They're able to do the work to create uh, a diverse group of people to come together, uh, not just your friends, <laughs> not just your, you know, your supporters, but people who may not agree with you. They're, they're, they're so uh, creative and, and um, patient, profoundly patient <laughs> and, and strategic um, that they can do this. And people think it's magic or luck or somebody gave them an easy uh, hand up. No, it was hard work. It was strategy. It was a lot of building of mutual care. And that's, that's an important thing about that, that. You know, empathy is not something that comes quick or easy, I think, for, you know, most people. When I talk with my students um, about, you know, climate communication and climate storytelling, I always pose the question, when you're talking with people, you need to ask them, what's in it for me? Because a lot of times people are so focused on themselves, you know, our life, you know, jobs, staying healthy, staying, you know, family, all the things that, you know, are re really important. I don't mean that in that, you know, we're self-centered, but you know, there are needs that we focus on. How do you break through that, you know, that kind of mentality of what's in it for me? Or do you use that to your advantage in building empathy? I think um, it is quite natural for people to ask that question and, and at the at the sort of ground level of building empathy, you can talk about, oh, what's in it for me? And people understand something or may, um, may pay more attention or trust a process more if they can see their own benefit. But I think true empathy comes when you can um, develop um, altruism, this altruistic uh, feeling, this, this deeper compassion. And uh, again, back to the example of my parents, um, you know, they are very humble, modest people, but their, um, their sacrifice <laughs> inspired my sister and I, and I, I hope that the work we have done, which is now you know growing and global, um, most people know that story, and they're still inspired by um, the action that a, a, a two people <laughs> can take and what that can do. Now, uh, we in you know as a result over the many years with many people's um, 
uh, cooperation, we have been able to educate and mentor thousands. And um, we've done something even, I think, more subtly um, challenging, which is to put out a new idea of how to frame and understand Tibet. Um, uh, not only in the way that it's been understood for decades, but also as a place where there are incredibly creative, intelligent, persistent, strategic people who can be uh, cultural leaders at a difficult time. It's it's all, um, as you said, Wes, long term work. <laughs> no, and and I think that that the the lesson I think of is like you know, things that are worth the most sometimes take the longest to get there and that's okay. And I, I think that's a bit of an, you know, a thing, a mindset we have to get into, it feels like in talking with you and seeing what you're talking about is that, you know, things aren't gonna happen overnight. We have to be willing to put in a little bit more work and focus right. on that to make sure that we can reach the goals that we want. Um, and it, it is inspiring to the story of your parents to think about, you know, how you know, two people made such an impact. How many students have gone through the school now in the 20 years? Oh my goodness, uh, many hundreds. We're now in the process of doing an exact count, but um, on any given day, there's about 850 kids. Um, and then we started another program in another part of Tibet that has educated over 2,000 young women and girls uh, from, again, K to PhDs, uh, so on and so forth. So it, it uh, yeah, it's, it's really, sometimes I feel like, you know, you always feel like you never do enough <laughs> uh, or it's never fast enough, but it's, it's really um, lovely to, to reflect on how many people around the world have come together yeah. to do work, but also the impact that um, is already very real. And that, that I hope, is only more of an incentive for us to stay engaged in, in, in challenging long-term programs and, and long-term projects, whether it's climate change or pandemic or Tibet or what, what have you. There's so much in the world to explore and understand. Um, I really, I think, want to make the point of um, the uh, empathy-based long-term engagement and how important that is to have um, lasting impact. So again, I, I want to go back to the empathy thing because you know I'm kind of switched in watching you to my professor, you know, lecturer mode of like, okay, I've got 20 students. How do I help them understand what empathy is and get to it? Because it takes time. It's long. Um, it's a lot of work which inherently may not sound like fun, um, which I think a lot of, a lot of you know, right now, if, if it's not fun and engaging right away, how do you keep people you know, invested in it and make something that is long-term accessible? What are some of the first steps if you know, I were to be talking to some students about gaining empathy or you know, growing my own ability to be empathetic? What, what ways, what, what things can I do? Right. Excellent question, Wes. And um, again, uh, whether you're talking about Tibet or overcoming climate change, the climate crisis and so many other you know, wildlife conservation, uh, so many good uh, challenges in the world that we need to work on. Um, I think um, I'm going to quote <laughs> somebody who deeply inspires me uh, to do this work. His name is Dashi Sangbo. He's a brilliant monk, a citizen scientist in Tibet, who has led hundreds of his local fellow um, pastoralists, uh, herders, uh, to become citizen scientists. And what he, the, the incredible work that he has done, um, he always talks about how first in order, to, first you have to know about something, then you you will build naturally uh, care and compassion for that issue, and then you can take appropriate action. I, I would um, really just uh, emphasize, uh, you know, and I, I'm sure other people have also followed this kind of philosophy, but uh, knowledge, self knowledge, and knowledge of the other, knowledge of the issue, fundamentally important. And then I would say social engagement. Um, you know, uh, all around the world, we have very clear examples of dis social disparity and people who can't talk to each other. It's not going to be easy, but oh boy, there is a way forward, and and we have to engage with each other by ignoring each other and standing uh, standing far apart. Nothing, you're, you're guaranteed, nothing's going to happen. So there has to be the the uh, difficult um, willingness to actually engage with one another, and then once we you know, take that step in engaging very deep listening, the process of deep listening, 
uh, where you say less and listen more. Uh, not easy to do again, but wow, uh, really enlightening. So um, such an important way to learn. And it not only do you learn, you show the other person, the other side, the, the other communities that you have the capacity to actually care about what they're seeing, even if you don't agree, but to care that you try to see things from their viewpoint. And then I think, um, so with knowledge, with social engagement, with deep listening, um, it is much more possible to build trust. And I think that's the, the foundation of change. Oh, trust is what it always comes down to. And the, the, that is foundational and it can't be achieved without empathy. So you're really teaching very foundational keys to you know, not just conservation and change, you know, for the betterment of the environment, but also social change, cultural you know, change, educational, like just so many great things. These are all the, this is the, this is the key to any positive steps forward, it sounds like, is what you've taught us today. That's been our experience. <laughs> <laughs> so really, it, it's it's been fantastic to like talk about that and like really think about this big concept and kind of thank you for giving us kind of the steps that we can start, you know, working towards being better with empathy ourselves, trying to find it in others. And that active listening, that is such a great suggestion. Um, one that I've found has really been helpful for me along the way and all the work that I do. And yes. so thank you for bringing that up. And we've got a, one more, I think I've got one more question, but if, if, if not actually a question, anything you want to like, end us up with or anything that you're thinking right now or something we should do to, you know, today and thinking of, you know, Valentine's Day about love. Is there anything we should do to kind of keep that empathy going forward today as we greet the rest of the day? We've got, you know, 4 p.m. here for me. You know, we go West Coast. It's, you know, uh, 1 p.m. What can we do today to help build empathy? Wow, so much. Thank you, Wes, for the opportunity <laughs> to have one more uh, <laughs> say. Um, I think I would like to say, uh, you know, of all the different um, social movements and causes I am involved in, including Tibet, of course, um, something, okay, firstly, I believe um, most people have such a good core and um, it takes courage to uh, reach out to that in other people because it requires us to be more vulnerable as well. Um, I know that's a very basic thing, but it's it's just works so it works so well, <laughs> and uh, it's it's been a really good um, uh, way forward for us. And um, so the you know the the willingness to be uh, vulnerable, and then also I think I would like to add that. Cynicism is such a barrier to building empathy. And um, I think I have seen in different countries, in different age groups around the world, that uh, sometimes cynicism is seen as being smarter or being more edgy or what have you. But I, um, and I believe in being constructively critical, absolutely. Uh, it's trained in the academy to do that. But I also think that cynicism for the sake of cynicism is also um, the purview of the elite, people who um, will not suffer the consequences of that kind of cynicism because it can block empathy, it can block um, the building of uh, trust that comes out of empathy and hopefully uh, socially constructive um, action. Well, I am even wow that that is really important to think about vulnerability and i know a lot of us are taught to you know not show those things and that is how you open up that's how you gain trust that's how you show people um you know that you are someone who is willing to invest in them and has empathy and understanding exactly. so i really appreciate you you touching on that um it's uh, this might be the first time i think that this is comparison will happen but this is actually <laughs> a very important part of rupaul's drag race is talking about vulnerability and showing who you are. So I'm going to say that RuPaul must be paying attention to you because I'm <laughs> quite sure you came to it first and she's just you know, ripping on what you're teaching. So thank you so much for showing us how to engage with empathy, be a little bit vulnerable, and hopefully 
make some connections throughout the rest of the day and moving forward. So thank you so much, Lozang. Really appreciate it. And if anyone wants to you know, get more information, you can uh, follow Lozang on Instagram or you can head to Twitter and check out Machik. And I got that wrong. Machik, yes. Right? yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, Machik on underscore online on Twitter and follow up. And then maybe even one day you can join Machik Weekend. So thank you so much, Lozang, and have a great afternoon. It was wonderful to talk with you. And wonderful we'll be with you. our next guest shortly. Bye.